Hi, I'm Rachel Disler. I'm the artist of The Nightcrawlers and of The Unseen in Dandy Presents Penny Dreadfuls. And you can find me uh, at Red Tie Bear at Instagram and Twitter. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on another interview with a very talented and creative person. She is an artist extraordinaire. She has a couple of projects on the go currently. One most notably is Dandy Presents Penny Dreadfuls, as well as an upcoming series in March of 2023 called The Night Crawlers, which she was originally scheduled to talk about, but we'll save that for next year. We are joined today by the ever-talented <laughs> Rachel Distler. How are you doing today? Good. Don't worry. That happens a lot. Many, many college graduations in my family have gone very similarly. As long as I didn't say distillery, then, you know, that's something complete. That also happens. Jeez, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> like, we are, we're all very used to it. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm a little underslept, but, you know, that's pretty normal for, you know, pretty par for the course. How are you doing today? Doing good, doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and, of course, what you're bringing to Two Geeks Socking today. Today, I mentioned Dandy Presents, Any Dreadful. So just kind of talking about, really, that was my first release in, like, the Diamond catalog. Just, like, excited to talk about that. I've been working on a lot of indie comics, a lot of indie releases. There was the Color of Always that came out earlier this year. Some stuff for, like, Wildstar Press. I just kind of like talking about what it's like to be in the weeds as, like, a very beginner published artist. It's always great to see someone's journey, whether they're starting out or whether they've been a professional for many decades. You know, I, I love seeing that in everyone that comes on this particular show. But what about your journey? How did you get started with the creative art of illustration and comics? If we really want to go super way back, probably one of the first things that I tell people, honestly, was I read a lot of Garfield comics <laughs> in the newspaper. And so my dad would buy me these collected copies of like all the Garfield comics. And then it kind of got to this point where I don't know if anybody remembers this early comic software where it was specifically tailored to make Garfield comics. Yeah. I think it was on the Windows 95 yeah. <laughs> or something. I think it had to be like that. It was like the big tan monitor. And I would just spend like hours assembling, I would assume these non sequitur Garfield comics. Toonami happened and, you know, something clicked in my brain where it's like, I guess this is what I do now. <laughs> so like ever since then, you know, I've just been really fascinated by how comics work and why I think they're so potent as like a narrative medium, why, what makes them really different compared to any kind of media really with like sound or movement and why we connect with those things like so personally. Now I'm here, I guess. Why do you, and that's a good question actually, why do you think that the comics are a more consistent medium for conveying messages and thought than other mediums like say music or film? I live by this college and pretty early on when I, like I didn't actually go to this college, I just happened to live very close to it. <laughs> I was just kind of like walking through the, like the campus because it's connected to a park and you're, you're just free to walk around. And I saw this board and it was advertising like that night, like lo and behold, what luck, they were having a artist talk with Art Spiegelman. And so I was like, okay, gotta go. I'm at this talk later that night. He has this really wonderful breakdown about what he thinks is really, really special about what makes comics work. And that sort of elucidated some of my ideas, really. You know, he talked about when people recall like their memories or want to tell stories, often what happens really is you're not living like a very continuous playing video of your life. Really what you're kind of doing is imagining these like separate segments that all build up like into a story and very much like that is what happens when you have comics you know you have these spliced up pieces of art these like pieces of story that all come together and inform each other and like build into different kinds of meaning the fact that we 
think this way is so incredible and so close to like what we're doing with comics that really thinking on his words and realizing like, yeah, you know, that's how I imagine, at least to me, like how we are like trying to tell each other different kinds of stories, things about ourselves, even how our day was. Like everything is just sort of like a fragmented little bit going through your mind and you're just kind of putting them together. And so it really resonated with me. So then I have to ask here, what is your creative kryptonite as an artist? Uh, At this point, I'd probably say a lot of burnout. (laughs) (laughs) Like I, I should probably sleep more. Everyone's always telling me I need to sleep more. Like I'm looking at like this whole list of what I've been working on and I have like a pile of scripts right beside me. I definitely need to lay down and sleep a lot more often. If people would stop sending me such great scripts, maybe I would lie down and take some sleep. But I'm just always like so excited when somebody sends me something really, really cool that like I have to jump on it. Comes the refrain like, Rachel, do you ever sleep? Not really. There are some days where like, I'll just be sitting at my drawing table, just absolutely no thoughts, head empty. (laughs) (laughs) It's like not coming to me. Um, Maybe I'll lie down for a nap or something, but like that's, that's gotta be the thing is like needing to slow down a little bit. Let's talk about some of your professional career so far here. Like regarding some of the other projects, you'll probably hear me bring up like Brent Fisher a lot because we do a lot of projects together. They're like the primary writer I work with right now. They wrote, (laughs) it's a whole laundry list. Well, first of all, they wrote the story for Dandy Presents Penny Dreadfuls. It was kind of funny because when they like sent it in, I I think we both kind of assumed like, okay, this story is going to fly off into the ether. We're just going to like hope to hear back, kind of like a competition sort of thing. Like it was an open call essentially. And so they would pick from like the top three and knowing exactly how many submissions get sent into this kind of thing. We're like, well, you know, it's great that we had something ready to go. They're insanely fast. Like they write like beautiful scripts over the course of a 30 minute lunch break from their job. I just, I don't, I don't even know how that's feasible, but like, that's what happened. You know, I thought the dialogue was like spectacular and I don't know how you do that within 30 minutes. <laughs> they send it off with like my artwork and things. I go back to working on the night crawlers furiously. And then like one day they just like message me and they're like, Oh, so we got into the, thing like oh oh my god i have to uh definitely just kind of drop what i'm doing right now and like get on that super super quick the turnaround on that was pretty quick i think ultimately after edits and things were done um we were left with three weeks to get it together which isn't it's not terrible for just like six pages also you know the recurring rounds of edit colors and also handling a bunch of the other projects i'm working on was like pretty intense um very much worth it well we did the story for like the color of always one of the founders of extra pages press and that's how we met i think almost exactly a year from now that we had met and i'm looking at this and i'm like one two three four like there's a lot of stuff in the works you know they reached out to me for a story with dauntless we're going to be like working on I think they said like 64 pages, something like that. So like, yeah, it's it's definitely piling. We're just like working on a a ton of things together. Otherwise, I worked with Damien Becton on our story, A Certain Morality uh, for Songs of the Sea, which was like really, really wonderful. I remember they just like sent me a message, I think on Instagram was just like, you like pirates? (laughs) Like, boy, howdy, I do actually love pirates. This would be great. These incredible writers just like finding my inbox. Hey, here's a thing I did 30 minutes to a day, just immaculate. And that's why the burnout happens because like, I just, I have to have it. (laughs) Like I have to see my name on the story and say like, I was smart enough not to pass it up. (laughs) After that, you know, I'm working on maybe like some pitches, trying to like shop things around a story, Moon Bat with Bryce of Booth, going to be like pitching, finding a place for, there's Oracle, Shanae Kinney, working on an ash can called like Haley Brown. That's like kind of a tentative name. All of this falling in line as I'm also trying to finish like the Nightcrawlers, which is so close. We're so close. I'm terribly sorry that... (laughs) 
yeah, it got delayed, which we definitely should talk about when it comes out. Because if I, this is where we're kind of looking right now with all of the pages. There's another stack beside it. Just like watching that whole thing pile up. I usually like would work traditionally. I've been doing more digital lately, but like the benefit of working traditionally is being able to physically see exactly how much sleep you've lost (laughs) in one beautiful pile. It's been a super whirlwind. And, and, you know, now we're working on a sharp wit in the company of women, uh, like a story called Invictus, just like something they just rattled off the top of their head. At least I I assume so. That's how Brent makes it sound like, oh, I had this idea. It it occurred within five minutes. It's flawless. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Like, whatever you want to do, I'm definitely on board. So it's it's cool to have a creative partner like that. I do miss my bed, but, you know, I I really enjoy drawing all these stories. So, like, you know, it's it's a fair trade-off. It's safe to say that sleep will not be coming anytime soon unless you pass out while you're holding one of your cat's drawings. I mean, that does happen more often than not. Well, I think last night, actually, I fell asleep while holding my iPad while Procreate was open. (laughs) I think that in order to get ahead, when you are just like starting a published career, you're just like, what's the next project? What's the next project? What's the next project? And uh, like a personal rule of mine is to just like never take a project that you don't a thousand percent believe in because if it crashes and burns at least you get to say you had a great time but if and when it succeeds you're just like daha i told you so what did i tell you and (laughs) you get to be like really smug about it and i'm pretty excited for that i hope that gets to happen i feel like starting out i shouldn't really bank on one thing i should get to know you know who are essentially my you know my classmates right like who is working at like the same level as I am or who's aiming for like the same kind of goal. Just like get to know everybody really, really well. See who you collaborate with super, super well. Find, you know, your dream partnerships. Just like take it from there, you know. Making comics is really hard, but you know, friends make it nicer along the way, right? And it's a small community as well too. As wide of a world that we are living in currently and as small as it is digitally with the internet, and social media, the comic circles are fairly small. So it gets around pretty fast about who does what. Right. I like what I'm seeing, and I, and I liked what I saw with Nightcrawlers. And well, thank you. Let's touch on Nightcrawlers. I definitely want to have you back on because Source Point Press has been. So tell us about the Nightcrawlers elevator pitch and how did you find your art style for that? As for the elevator pitch, I mean, I think that Marco Lopez, like the writer, mm-hmm. really nails it with the tagline when something goes bump in the night they bump back it feels very goonies when i'm i'm drawing it just like really getting into the mindsets of all the characters and trying to like play their personalities off of each other uh, is a lot of fun honestly with the art style for that i just kind of went with it wanted to do something that's both energetic and kind of cute but kind of like really dynamic in the sense of for this book we're we're specifically focusing on like the look of werewolves mm. and one of the difficult tightrope walks i think sometimes is like you know working in the genre of children's horror is like okay remember being a kid remember reading goosebumps what's the fine line between good scary and bad scary <laughs> when i'm doing the night crawlers i try to keep in mind like what's accessible for kids but kids still love you know scary things you know i feel like i still have a very childlike fascination with just like horror i'm always watching like horror YouTube channels and things. You know, for sure, I never thought I would be asked to do so much horror. That wasn't like something I never, like I ever thought that like would be a thing, you know, Penny Dreadfuls and it was, is, a, is a horror. Be it like an LGBT horror meant more for adults. So I felt like I could be, you know, maybe a little bit more on the nose with like some of the violence and like some of the foreboding atmosphere. But for the night crawlers, you know, I'm like looking at a page like right over there, like, you know, there's like a werewolf attack. I kind of keep it a little bit more kinetic and a little bit more manga inspired where like, I certainly want to show how intimidating like a werewolf is and how obviously bad it would be to be attacked by 
a werewolf, but nothing, you know, I can't get very much graphic with a, I want to scare children, but I want to scar children for life. And I definitely don't want this thing that I constantly am sweating about where it's like, you know, a kid is definitely going to be the one who points at this book and says, you know, hey, mom, hey, dad, I want to read this book. And then, you know, their parent will just like look through the book. I'm so sorry about my cat. <laughs> this one's rolling. I was like, I told you I'd be harassed by these guys. And then they would just look at the book and be like, oh, this is pretty graphic. I don't think we're going to get this one. It's a very tight balance there. Otherwise, I just kind of want to focus on just like fun character designs, just kind of some of the things that I see in some middle age, you not middle age readers, but middle readers. You know, kids kind of like with a cool sense of fashion, uh, just like different distinct personalities, like when you see them. And that's that's kind of like where I'm trying to keep my head whenever I sit down to pencil down on the pages. If you can create silhouettes of your characters and they're uniquely distinct, and I don't know who's uh, who actually said that pro at some comic convention. Oh, probably, yeah. <laughs> identify characters based on their silhouettes you've done a good job with your creation of your character right right think like more and more i want to push myself into that realm and that was something i was keeping in mind when making the characters like there isn't anybody who's too outrageously say like oversized or like really small i do try to keep it within like a certain vibe but you know when thinking about like what they're wearing especially like we have a character who's like a bounty hunter and her name's like Greta. And one of the things that like I wanted out of her silhouette was like, what about a really cool brimmed hat and these very tight lines from like her shirt and her boots, like something that conveys, you know, like a level of seriousness, but like a little bit of flair. I had a lot of fun making Calvin. He's like one of my favorite characters. So, you know, I gave him a very distinct hairstyle so that, you know, you'll always be able to, like, pick them right out. You know, there's, like, Mika, and <laughs> I don't know, like, because they, they have this sort of interplay with each other where they're always trying to vie for the position of, like, leader of, like, the Nightcrawlers. I kind of had this, like, <laughs> vision in my mind, like, what if we gave Mika, like, a version of the fur-lined coat that Squall wears from Final Fantasy VIII? Like, somebody who's, like, kind of cool, yeah. even if, like, I think she's also really funny. Two characters I think convey cool, but, like, in different ways. Like, somebody with a very stylish haircut, almost like an army-style jacket, and then somebody who takes, like, a different road of cool. Like, somebody who has sort of, like, a chopped-up hair cut upturned like fur what would those two look like constantly butting heads all the time while everybody in the background you know you've got like bruno who's kind of your lovable giant and his sister who's like a goofy kind of wyatt but like pops in at just the right time with the funniest comment like sister and then there's like franny who i gave her like hair that covers her eyes and like super into metal music like kind of outfit Maybe like her dog matches like the outfit, you know, they both wear a bandana, that kind of thing. And just like tying it all together and making them stand out whenever they're in like a group shot together. In your opinion, what is the most important quality of an artist in comics today? And how does that translate to what you've worked on? Oh, mm, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, have you ever heard the phrase like, yeah, there's there's no perfect pasta sauce, but perfect pasta sauces. Um, like, you know, one thing can't be perfect, but it's the milieu of things that like create a really wonderful atmosphere. There's like something perfect out there for someone. You know, um, I think, you know, obviously raw talent can't take you anywhere. Um, you know, all the way, it's always going to be a split between you know, ability and just the tenacity to work really hard. And um, even when it's like not comics or just like life things, because, you know, it, it happens, like life happens. I think that that level of tenacity to just like allow things to fail when they happen, as long as you get back on the horse, you're going to be fine. I think, you know, if you can endure you know, setbacks and just things going up in smoke in your life. And um, 
just like remembering how much you love creating and expressing yourself. Um, you're going to be, you're going to be just fine. I think obviously like a lot of things play into it, but maybe it's tenacity or maybe it's being blindly stubborn, frankly, uh, <laughs> that is going to do the trick. But I think as long as you remember like, okay, I could be 25 with a book or I could be 78 with a book, but either way, I'm going to have a book. Just like, don't give up on it. Just throw things at the wall if you need to. Um, but I, I would say like, perhaps being as stubborn as a mule is the most important thing I can, I can recommend because uh, I got, I got pretty sidetracked in my twenties. <laughs> Let me say <laughs> doing a lot of things I thought I should be doing, um, but that I absolutely hated. <laughs> um, and then just like getting back on it and just being like, you know, one day just playing video games. It's just like, God, I wish I had a book to work on right now. And now I have several books because I was just like, let's just do it. Let's like, let's crank it. Let's go. And now I look at my PS4 and it's dusty and I'm sad, but I am working on these books and it is a much better place to be. I promise. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Ooh, boy, that's interesting. I'm trying to think about like something in particular, maybe not like early on in my life because I was and am an incredibly awkward human being. I mean, I guess I could say the cumulatively being awkward and trying to make friends would convey that like, yeah, I should learn how to use my words good if I want to have friends. But I remember one of the most potent things I ever learned about like really trying to communicate with other people and also kind of feed that into maybe even like the creative process. Growing up, you know, my teachers were always just like screaming over a classroom full of children and trying to impress on the importance of listening. Maybe the most powerful listener I've ever met in my entire life was Probably when I was like, I want to say like 21, 22, I worked at a cafe as a barista and this guy, we would call him like the mayor, even though he was never the mayor. Sometimes the actual mayor would come in, but we called this guy the mayor. He lived like right next door and he's just like the sweetest hippie you would ever meet in your life. And he had such amazing listening skills. Like, you know, maybe I wouldn't be on the right shift when he would come in. Maybe I'll see him two weeks from like the last time I saw him. And he will remember every single thing that you told him about what was going on in your life. And that was really powerful. Like somebody who just comes up to your register, asks how your day is going, really sincerely mean it. And so you would tell him how your day is actually going and how your life is actually going. Then he would come in two weeks later and have like the perfect follow-ups for every little thing like, oh, did you ever get over your cold? How was that visit that you took with your sister? Oh, you know, did you get your car fixed? That kind of thing. Oh, did you take it here? That really struck me. And the fact that that meant so much, not just to me, but to literally everybody who worked there or anybody who knew him was just incredible powerful and that kind of left me receptive even more to really trying to suss out the like fine details of what somebody is trying to tell you because like that is something incredibly human which is something that I think from any comic we're really just trying to find any story any tv show any movie uh, we're always just trying to like find that like little nugget of humanity. I do some writing by and large these days. Like I am mostly like illustrating books and trying to interpret them for writers. It often just comes from being intuitive and a very good listener. There are things that <laughs> I have held on to because I'm just looking for these opportunities to learn about the experiences of other people. Like one time I went into a fitting room of a Goodwill and somebody had dropped a letter, like a handwritten letter that they wrote to what sounds like a crush that they've had for 10 years, but they never got 
to like get together and then they had separate families and this was like the wildest confession you could ever find like two pages i've kept that because it's sort of this reminder of like what exactly are we searching for when we listen to people like this is somebody who could not talk to this person and so what they did was write it all out in a letter just like completely anonymous we're all sort of wanting somebody to talk to when you meet somebody or get to know them or maybe just having like a one-off conversation keep those ears open because you're going to find those little little things especially when it's somebody you're really trying to get to know that somebody you really care about be a good listener follow up on it whether you're gonna just remember it later because all right, you're just looking for reference but really you just like care about them you just want to know what it's like to be them for a second just like pay attention, be the hippie guy, (laughs) you know, make that kind of impact. And I think if you can remember those things and write about it or draw it and try to convey that whenever you draw a panel full of characters interacting, like if you can make that connection, you've done all the work. There's like nothing more to do. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Super, super tricky because it is hard to pinpoint maybe like any one person whose journey like really got me through all of these hard moments. I mean, I've been inspired by always get along super well with my parents, but we are very generationally different. My mom came over from the Philippines where she was just trying to raise her siblings because, you know, for reasons like either her dad was like uninvolved or it's sometimes like her mom having that sort of fortitude to get through it has been a lot of food for thought. Same with my dad. He's really smart and he's extremely good at numbers, which I did not inherit at all. I will absolutely destroy all of your tax books if you let me, like don't let me near anything with math in it. But you know, the fact that he never stopped learning. I was mentioning just like all of these graduations that I've been to. So many of them have just been watching my own dad, like get degree after degree after degree finding out that like it's really important to never stop learning and to go into different careers if that's where your mind leads you like that's super important in art school I had a teacher it was Bob McLeod and he did a lot of the like sequential art classes over at my college he's a little man but he is brutal as you would expect from somebody who'd worked with like Marvel and DC for as long as he has like he has this ability it's like magic you know you could put up any drawing on the wall doesn't matter what it is And he would go right up to it, maybe like three inches away from his face, squint. You know, he'd have his like arm behind his back with a pencil and he'd whip out that pencil and then exactly two marks, it would fix your drawing. (laughs) I, I don't, I can't even explain how he does that. And it's funny, a lot of people compliment me on my inking and maybe it's because he was like, Rachel, your inking is flat. Frankly, it's terrible. (laughs) I'm like, of course it's terrible, Bob. You're Bob (laughs) McLeod. Like I, I... What am I, you're a legend. Like, what am I supposed to say to this? The fact that, like, maybe out of spite, just like I have to get better at inking because I just want Bob McLeod to be like, that, that's not too bad, Rachel. <laughs> just like give you know, the little, little bits of feedback, like over my life where it's like, I can't give up because, you know, like if my mom was able to do it, I can do it. You know, I feel too dumb to learn something. Well, if my dad can get like 17 degrees, then I can do it, right? I have a little bit of his DNA at least. Got like Bob McLeod, who's always just like up there in the clouds. And he's just like, pretty good, Rachel. Not great, but pretty good. And I'm like, oh, one day, one day. <laughs> You're going to look at something I've done and maybe you'll only put like one stroke on there instead of two. Uh, (laughs) That's all I'm really like aiming for, that fortitude and tenacity to just say like, okay, today let's try a little harder is pretty much what's dragging me through the creative process right now. From a professional standpoint, you have created, of course, the Nightcrawlers, which will come out in March of 2023, as well as you've worked on Penny Dreadfuls and a bunch of other works you've mentioned in the show as well. And I'm sure much more in the future that's coming your way, plus the pile beside you as well, too. Oh, yeah. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? 
Uh, <laughs> I would say absolutely not. There's still like, a th- I guess, a thing to be said about remaining hungry. And who knows if like the success is remaining hungry. At least as far as I can say right now, you know, I still have that laundry list of work to do. I think unless I'm leaving a huge mile long wake of pages behind me, I wouldn't say I'm successful quite yet. Like, I think I'm getting somewhere. I think if people keep sending me these scripts, it says that I'm cluing into something important. But my work is yet incomplete. (laughs) My dark work is unfinished. I don't know. Maybe the hunger is success, but I haven't made like my 25 manga Tonkuban au revoir yet. (laughs) So at this very moment, I would say not yet, but I'm on to something. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? Mm, That is a tricky one. I think it helps that I have a very poor memory. (laughs) Frankly, (laughs) if I just kind of, you know, accept failure and sleep on it, those feelings of failure tend to dissipate enough. Eventually my brain fritters onto like the next project and I say, well, let's do it. Let's just see where this goes out. Like, let's just feel it, get through it. Like even with the night crawlers, we were rejected. Oh Lord. Over the course of several years, it's really been something that I think like we first discussed it in like 2016. And it wasn't until maybe 2020, 2021 that we first heard back from like you know a blaze in this situation like a yes and so that was about oh like at least four years of solid like "Mm, we already have something like this in our catalog or just like nothing at all you know it was a bit disheartening because when i had uh, first said yes to the nightcrawlers it was just like i found this post on a forum board from Marco was like, I have this idea, you know, going back to like my belief that like, I'm only going to work on things that I believe in like a thousand percent. Like I read it, digested it. It was like, oh, this is fantastic. You know, those four years of being like, have my senses led me astray? Has this like been a complete just like run around and like throughout that time, just also dealing with like, you know, personal things. Ah, the rent's due. I'm broke. The little uh, things that certainly feel like failures that just feel very insurmountable at the time. (laughs) Just kind of sleeping on it and just remembering like, it's going to be another sun coming up tomorrow. And I'm not the only one on earth with a very poor memory. (laughs) People are going to forget. I'm going to forget. We're not all going to dwell on it forever. Realizing that if I don't become the agent of change, like in my own life, if somebody is going to make that decision for you, it may not be a deliberate decision on like somebody's part. For example, what year was it? I mean, it's not super important. I think it was like actually kind of roughly around the same time, you know, Marco began pitching for the night crawlers. Like I got fired <laughs> at my job. You know, my wife wasn't working at the time. So, you know, it was up to me to pay the bills and all this other stuff. And I, well, she did actually just start working. So we were like finally getting a little comfortable again. When like, oh, there goes like my income for God knows how long. And like that certainly felt like a failure. And that certainly felt like somebody has made this decision above me of what to do. But if I decide to like sit down, and this is like around the time when I I was saying like, okay, I've been miserable kind of doing this job anyway. What if I just went back to making comics like I always wanted to, like I always like intended to, but I don't have any of the work that I would like to show for it. I I guess it worked out okay. (laughs) Just remember that you're going to forget, they're going to forget, and you want to be able to fall back on like those decisions that you made for yourself that you're going to be happy with and like inevitably if you are making those decisions for yourself you'll be happy with it the younger generation is looking at your work and then becoming inspired to be creative in their own way whether it's as a comic artist or a creative person in some way shape or form they are looking at your work and becoming inspired how can they inspire the generation that follows them Mm, 
Well, that's that's like a very far off question. Let me kind of dig deep for this one. You know, thinking about like things as, as a chain of generational creativity, I frankly wouldn't know exactly how to frame my style, but I think everybody is able to point out that like, yeah, there's some anime in there. I was going to school. It's very traditional. There wasn't really anybody doing that, believe it or not, at the time. Throughout my four years in art school, it gets up to like senior thesis. I decide, you know, to do comics. Like, yeah, I'm going to do it. We had to pick like an industry and do something for it. Demonstrate this is the focus that I'm going into in a very practical sense. While I wasn't the only person to do comics, I was certainly the only one doing like anything vaguely manga inspired. I will also credit Bob McLeod, we had these kinds of talks in his class. And, you know, he's generations above me and thinking about the ways that like his work inspired other people. And now he's teaching like another generation. People would ask him like, well, what do you think of manga influenced art becoming very prevalent in comics or at least beginning to? And, you know, he was very frank and open. He's like, I have no problem with it. I think it's great. Like, you know, it's getting people to go and get inspired and make books. And it's just like the natural progression of things. By the time I was done, there's my senior thesis. I do comics and it's manga influenced. Every year, like I live in the same city as the college I graduated. Every May they have their own open like senior thesis. So I can go back and see what other students are doing now. And there's just like a plethora of comics and they're all like very manga inspired. <laughs> His prescience is like correct. So the thing that I kind of had to buck a trend for at the time is now just like so common, which is great. Like I, I love seeing that. So I would think that like in this sort of timeline and progression, if people, you know, say like a kid picks up the night crawlers and looks at my artwork and says like, this is great. And they want to start drawing like their favorite characters from the book, which is, you know, very much how it begins. Look, I watched Toonami and made a lot of Tenchi fan art. That's how it works. <laughs> and they start kind of going from there. But Manwa is super popping off right now, which is, you know, its own distinct uh, art form, even like from manga and like where, where what the sort of the sensibilities are behind uh, manhwa versus like manga. I don't really know how to differentiate the pronunciation. So there's like manhwa with like HWA at the end and that's Korean. <laughs> that's like Korean uh, comics. Nice. And there's like manhwa with like HUA and that's Chinese. Chinese. Um, specifically, I'm, I'm talking about uh, Korean yeah. Manwa, like if you're looking at things like webtoons or you're looking at things mm. like global comics or tapas, yeah. so these huge meeting grounds of like self-published, these teams just totally coming together on their own, like nobody's like setting them up or anything. That of course has been a, an industry that's been going on for a good long while at this point. I think it's like pretty well established. Yeah. yeah, maybe some people might still feel like you have to go to a publisher or you gotta publish. It's own sort of debate. There's certainly nothing illegitimate about like making a webcomic. I think it would be ridiculous to make that claim. One of the ones that pops right into my mind, maybe like it wasn't on webtoons or anything, but Naimona became a huge thing, right? Yeah, like yeah. made online and then became, you know, published and boom, 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 like, and now we've got she <laughs> Obviously, these pathways are extremely legitimate. If we're looking at like the further continuation of these things, like Webtoons is so mm -hmm. huge right now. And a lot of it takes from that manhwa sensibility. Somebody looked at the Nightcrawlers and then grew up alongside Webtoons and gets influenced by all of those other things and creates this like enormous pastiche. If we're talking about like inspiring the generation past that, I think that's sort of the direction it's going in. I think it'd be wonderful. You know, somebody looked at my work, the way I looked at Garfield comics, <laughs> you know, I guess now instead of having a Garfield program creator, they would go into like Clip Studio Paint and like that already has Webtoon settings. You could do this at the age of seven if you're a mad lad, like absolutely. Maybe I wouldn't recommend putting a whole story out on the internet while you're a child. That's like another thing, but you could. You can at least get like those ideas and like that just starts like a whole nother generation of kids becoming adults 
who continue to buck this trend of maybe thinking they need a publisher for legitimacy, maybe another generation of kids who are pushing for different styles within their own college if they decide to go, because you certainly don't need to. It's going to be this like spiraling chain that keeps going on for eternity. Immensely exciting. I just feel like a dinosaur thinking about it. (laughs) This show got started interviewing webcomic creators back in 2008. Even back then, it was very much a struggle for to create their own work because back then you had a huge battle between the newspaper cartoonists mm-hmm. and, and the webcomic scene itself. Literally, it was like DC and Marvel would never look at anything to do with any webcomic creator whatsoever because they didn't realize that the internet was the way things were going to go Mm -hmm. rather than the publishing scene. I look at Webtoons now and I see that and I look at the Harvey Awards and I look at those types of comic publication awards and you see Batman now in the webcomic category. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I understand it. I think it's a, it's amazing that they're finally jumping on the span wagon, but it took them 20 some odd years to even get to that stage because they didn't think it was financially viable. In some ways, it felt like when that happened, it was still shocking that it was even happening yeah. because of how long, you know, DC had just poo-poo. not dipped their toes in at all. And yeah, absolutely kind of like poo pooed it. Then when it happened, it felt very organic which was kind of surprising, at least when I read the comics, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, this reads great. Like I I really enjoy like sitting down and reading them. A lot of ways it was like, what took you so long? Uh, Other than I guess being way too stuffy for it. (laughs) We'll just say, and people still kind of feel that way. Yeah, my parents are like way old. They're like, like, they're like crazy old. (laughs) I have to like uh, preface that. Like I, I was born when my dad was 50, like, like they, okay. my dad's old. So uh-huh. when I was talking about my book coming out, he was like, Oh, is this like some self published thing? And I'm like, why would it even matter if it was self published? Like, I mean, I'm sure he's not aware of things like Kickstarter or zoop. Yeah, you know, lots of other just ways to print your own book and create yeah. an audience. Yeah, exactly. Like that's just like the very tip of the iceberg. Like it could just remain an unprinted web comic and just have thousands and thousands of fans. And what is not legitimate about that? It's just a different, you know, mm. way to get the message out. I, I think it's great that we live an era where it's so widely accepted that you don't need to pass somebody's barriers in order to get your your comic or your story or anything out there that's like a really wonderful facet in oh. which we we live when even talking about like the hurdles of going through what it is to be creative it's just excellent that if you want to you can just post it there's kind of a bit less rejection along the way just even get your thing seen i mean i will reveal my dark past as a fan fiction writer Mm -hmm. it was great to just be able to take my favorite characters and make them do stuff because i wanted to and then people would leave comments and they would you know be like can't wait for the next chapter like how encouraging is that we talk a lot about failure as a creative but like those little wins right there like that's also like real development i remember when reading like a story about different teaching techniques like in in china i guess i have to see if this is this is true it seems very legitimate where you know if the teacher is grading your paper in china i read that like they would circle what you did right and X what you did wrong, because it's just as important to know what you're doing right, because we're all lost. And we don't really know what's sticking sometimes and what's not sticking. So rather than just tell somebody like, no, maybe skip X, Y, and Z, but keep doing A, B, and C, like that's that's just as formative. And so being able to have these platforms you know, for web comics and things has really shown us what does work. And that's changed the whole industry. I read so many web comics growing up. It's left me totally speechless, clearly. (laughs) (laughs) What an age we live in. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? (laughs) I was kind of thinking about this. Uh, I think it was even... I think I was even telling Brent about this because it it popped up in my Apple music. I was like, 
oh damn, I do love the bats. So they have this one song that I was like, yeah, this would be this would be the title of my life, which I guess is my comic book, which is Future Me Hates Me. <laughs> I can't sum up like a better sentiment that I feel about myself sometimes. It's like a double-edged sword where I'll forget to do something. I'll be like, oh, past Rachel, I can't believe it. But other times I'll do something ahead of time, but again, I can kind of foresee like, this is going to happen. Like I'm going to come home from work. I'm going to be really tired. So I'm going to do the dishes before I go to work. I'm going to be like, I'm going to be really nice to future Rachel. And then I'll come back and the kitchen's nice and clean. I'll be like, yes, like that was it. It'd be like, definitely future me hates me, which is also a song. So like that would, that would also be part of the soundtrack. I think, I mean, otherwise I'm starting a Weezer cover band nice. called Weeze Her. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely, you know, hit me up, uh, Rivers Cuomo, if you would like to do some soundtrack work whenever you're finished. I think, what, what, what did they recently do? They definitely did, like, was it music for Pixar? You know, maybe Weezer felt like doing me a song, maybe, maybe in the style of, like, some of the Alone albums. That would be, oh, like, yeah. really incredible. I, I, you know what? I will actually also say this. This would go on the soundtrack. They did a, frankly, personally terrible version of a song that they did. I knew way too much about Weezer. Uh, Rivers had a college band called Homie, and he wrote a song called Sheila Can Do It. One of the recent albums, Van Weezer, they did another version of Sheila Can Do It, which doesn't have nearly the same vibe. But if you look at the original lyrics, again, I know way too much about Weezer. It was originally titled Rachel Can Do It. Oh. And so sometimes when I'm having a bit of a downer, I put on the song. I was like, Rachel can do it. Yeah, you know, if Rachel can do it, I can do it. And I don't see the problem with that. There we go. Well, Rachel, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Yep. Thanks for listening to me like ramble about kind of anything and everything. <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we see all of your work on the internet? Uh, basically, you know, if you go on a Twitter or Instagram, uh, I use the handle Red Tie Bear. I use bears in a lot of stuff. I also have a coffee also under Red Tie Bear. You can find my portfolio under Red Tie Bear. So if you Google that, you're going to be able to find me. Well, like I said, that is this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, it's www.youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGTmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.